Camping is a cherished outdoor adventure for many, which carries with it both the exhilaration of the wilderness and the potential for the unexpected. In the dead of night, there is a primal vulnerability that comes with sleeping in a tent, separated by only a thin layer of fabric from the untamed world outside. It's during these moments of profound solitude that, on rare and chilling occasions, some campers have felt the heart-stopping terror of a bear ripping open their tent in the middle of the night. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we take a look at three times bears have fatally mauled a camper inside their tent. Welcome to Final Affliction. Grizzly bears are one of nature's most terrifying apex predators. They are the largest of the bear species and are normally found in the northwestern United States and western Canada. The average male grizzly bear can be up to six and a half feet tall. Some grizzlies, however, have been known to reach heights of up to nine feet and weigh as much as 1,000 pounds. Grizzly bears possess long, sharp claws that can be up to four inches long. They also have a very powerful jaw, and their bite force is one of the strongest when it comes to mammals. A grizzly bear's powerful bite can crush a human skull with ease. Its sharp claws can easily puncture human flesh, and its razor-sharp teeth can cut through muscle and bone. In addition to their deadly claws and teeth, Grizzly bears are also known for their volatile tempers, and they can be extremely dangerous, especially when threatened. Despite their size, strength, and short temper, grizzly bears are generally shy and reclusive animals. They will usually avoid contact with humans if possible. However, grizzly bears have been known to occasionally attack humans, especially if they feel threatened or when protecting their young. If you encounter a grizzly bear, it is important to stay calm and avoid making any sudden movements. Try to back away slowly and make yourself as small as possible. Whatever you do, do not run, as this may trigger the bear's predatory instincts to give chase. This is the tragic story of Leah Loken, the story of a strong and fearless woman who had an ill-fated encounter with this ferocious predator. Leah Davis Loken was born on December 16, 1955, in Corona del Mar, California. She enjoyed a childhood spent horseback riding and exploring the outdoors near her home in Laguna Beach. After many years of working as a registered nurse specializing in surgery recovery, Leah moved to California and built a home for herself in 2016. Leah's horrifying tragedy began on July 6, 2021. Leah and her sister had arrived the day before at a small town called Ovando, situated in Montana. They were taking part in an ultra-endurance cycling event that ran from Banff, Canada to New Mexico, a journey of nearly 4,000 kilometers. Leah was a competitive cyclist who took part in mountain bike races. She never let her age weigh her down, and she even won the Mammoth National Champion Enduro Race in July 2015 at 59 years old. In recent years, Montana's population of grizzly bears has expanded into new areas where people now live and visit. Consequently, interactions between grizzly bears and humans have been becoming more frequent in the northern Rockies. It got so worrying that requests were even submitted to lift the restrictions preventing the killing of dangerous wild animals such as bears not only in Montana but also in the adjacent states of Wyoming and Idaho. Upon arriving at Ovando, Leah immediately wanted to go camping outdoors. She had even found a perfect spot behind a nearby museum where she could get a phenomenal view of the beautiful night sky. Her sister and friend weren't too keen on her plan, however as they had heard reports of a wild bear roaming nearby. Her sister pleaded with her to ditch the risky idea and stay with her at a hotel, but Leah was too stubborn to heed her sister's warnings. She set up camp next to the Blackfoot River, failing to take into consideration that it bordered a forest where more than 1,000 grizzly bears roamed free. Despite the obvious risks, Leah felt relatively safe as she had not only brought with her a full can of bear spray, but she also met Texas couple Kim and Joe Cole, who shared her love for camping and erected their tent close by to hers, giving her a false sense of security. 
At 3 a.m., Leah was fast asleep when a hulking shadow appeared before her tent. Leah woke up to the sound of snuffling coming from nearby. She wasn't sure what it was, but it sounded big. The mysterious figure soon approached her tent, shrouding it in darkness with its shadow as it began sniffing where her head was located from the outside. Leah soon realized what that figure was and began screaming for help. Kim and Joe woke up to her screams and began shouting as well. The combined noise made by the trio was luckily enough to scare the bear away as it soon retreated back into the darkness. After making sure the bear was gone, the couple ran to Leah's side to check up on her. She assured them she was fine and they suggested it may be best for Leah to pack up her things and spend the rest of the night at a hotel for her own safety. Officers said the food conditioned bear showed no fear of humans and repeatedly ripped open coolers and pushed on tents in search of food. Leah told the couple that the bear appeared to be looking around for something and that it even huffed at her head. Apparently that grizzly was food conditioned. Grizzlies that are food conditioned have learned to seek out human food, which makes them highly dangerous as they no longer fear humans and more often than not associate humans with a potential meal when they see them. This is why it is important not to store any food in your tent when camping in an area where grizzly bears are known to roam as it will only bring them closer to you. Leah thought that by distancing herself from any sources of food that may attract a bear's attention, she could spend the rest of her night enjoying herself out in the open as she always liked. Leah scoured her tent for any crumbs of food she could find. She put inside a bag everything she thought may attract a grizzly bear's keen sense of smell, including some lentils and dried blueberries, and started almost 30 feet away from her tent. Finally, she thought to herself, she could sleep in peace and not have to worry. What Leah failed to consider, however, was that the containers she used to store her food prior to the previous bear encounter still reeked of blueberries, something which a grizzly bear's phenomenal sense of smell can easily pinpoint. At around 4 a.m., the coals were yet again awoken by horrifying noises. Joe realized that the noise was coming from Leah's tent and that she was being attacked despite not hearing her yell out for help. After exiting their tents, the couple was mortified by what they saw. They quickly pulled out their can of bear spray and rushed toward Leah, unloading on the beast as it pounced up and down on her tent. After it finally had enough, the bear let Leah go and retreated back into the woods. The Coles noticed Leah wasn't moving underneath her now destroyed tent. They ripped the torn tent away from Leah's body and were mortified by what they saw. It was Leah, now sitting motionless and bloodied, her neck and spine contorted in an unsettling fashion as the nearly 500-pound bear had come crashing down on her with all its might, likely causing instantaneous death. After arriving at the scene, investigators found an almost empty can of bear spray that seemed to have been sprayed recently right underneath her tent. Despite allegedly moving all food away, investigators discovered a small bag of dried blueberries inside her tent, as well as a saddlebag full of food that was likely overlooked by Leah just outside the entrance to her tent. In national news, we have disturbing details this morning about a California woman who was killed by a grizzly bear in Montana. Wildlife officials say that the bear pulled her from her tent in the middle of the night and killed her before fellow campers could use bear spray and get the animal to run away. Investigators theorized that Leah was awoken out of her sleep for the second time that night to the sight of the bear creeping inside her tent. Her sudden movements to grab her bear spray likely caused the bear to swipe at her neck as she squeezed the can of bear spray at the bear. Leah was unable to talk as the deep bleeding gashes now prevented her from screaming for help. Blinded by the bear spray while half inside Leah's tent, the bear began jumping up and down in attempts to free itself. It landed repeatedly on top of her, breaking her bones and killing her. On the 9th of July, three days after Leah's death, a four to seven year old bear was seen breaking into a chicken coop and was shot by officers. DNA analysis from the bear's paws confirmed that it was indeed the one who took Leah's life. 
The Davis family, who had lost their loved one in this tragic event, were devastated. Although, hopefully, they can find some semblance of comfort in knowing that the beast responsible won't be hurting anyone ever again. The tragic loss of Leah Davis Logan at the hands of a grizzly bear is a reminder of how important it is to be cautious when venturing into areas where these creatures are known to roam. No matter how well prepared you think you are when stepping into wild territory, sometimes there's just no avoiding an encounter with a wild animal. And as the human population continues to grow and expand into areas that were once wild and unexplored, the likelihood of coming face to face with the terrifying creature continues to increase. In the end, Leah's untimely death serves as a powerful warning to not only always be aware of your surroundings and take the necessary precautions, but to also heed nature's warnings and respect the boundaries of its many dangerous creatures. Otherwise, you may end up in death's cold embrace, your life withering away before your eyes as you're handed your final affliction. Julian Gautier was a musical composer. He was inspired by the sounds of nature and often took to recording the great outdoors to include in his unique musical performances. He was born in Canada to French parents. The wilderness and great outdoors were an integral part of his upbringing. But at the age of 19, he and his family moved back to France. In 2017, at the age of 42, he secured his dream position as a composer in residence for the Brittany Symphony Orchestra. It was an incredible opportunity to showcase his work. The inspiration he got from the natural world was still a big part of his masterpieces. He spent five months on the Kerguelen Islands in Antarctica, recording the sounds of nature for his orchestral piece called Symphony Australe, or Southern Symphony. The piece is intertwined with the sounds of penguins, seals, and the howling icy winds. A lot of preparation went into making his music. Recording the sounds was the fun part, but organizing the practical and logistical side of his travels was time-consuming. Following the success of his Southern Symphony, which was aired on French radio, he planned a visit back to his roots, Canada. The country was such a large part of his life, and having some of the sounds of home in his future work was a way of keeping Canada close to his heart. The trip was three years in the making, and Julien took with him biologist Camille Tuscany. The two of them planned to canoe nearly 1,000 miles down the Mackenzie River from Fort Providence to Inuvik. Along the way, Julien would be recording the sounds of the Canadian wilderness to work into his next symphony. But he would never get the chance to make his musical masterpiece. Disaster was about to strike in the worst way imaginable. The adventure was planned to take 30 days between August and September. And during that time, Camille's main job was to take photos of Julien as he made his recordings. Upon returning to France, Julien then planned to create a mini-concert around the project, with Camille's photos playing in the background. They crammed all their belongings into their two-man canoe. Julien stashed all his sound recording equipment into watertight containers when not in use. At the end of each day, they pulled up, dragging their canoe ashore and set up camp. After eating their dinner around the campfire, they would settle into their tents ready to take on the next leg of their journey. On August 6th, Julian updated his social media, describing the adventure through the rugged countryside as intense, tiring, and inspiring. During the same update, Julian suggested bear activity in the area. He reported that despite canoeing for five days, he and Camille hadn't seen a single soul for three of those days, except for four bears. Maybe this was a sign of things to come. As they canoed along through the breathtaking scenery, they were heading into some of the most remote wilderness in Canada. But halfway through their trip, something went horribly wrong. On the night of August 14, 2019, Julian and Camille went to sleep in their separate tents. They had finished their paddling for the day, eaten dinner, and then turned in for the night. But in the darkness, something was approaching. 
it was drawn to the smells and the presence of two humans in its territory. The keen sense of smell, 100 times more powerful than a human's, bears are thought to be able to home in on their potential prey from 20 miles away. Neither Julian nor Camille stirred. Outside their tents was a grizzly bear. It sniffed around their campsite, searching for signs of food. The sound from the river's rushing water masked any footsteps or snorts from the investigating bear. It was stealthy, curious, and it was on the hunt. A predatory bear can stalk a human undetected. Despite their immense size, they have the ability to sneak up on unsuspecting prey until they are within pouncing distance. The bear let out a low growl as it sniffed the canvas of Julian's tent. The photographer continued to sleep, unaware of the imminent danger he was in. Suddenly, it tore through the thin tent sides, its sharp curved claws slicing through the canvas like tissue paper. A second later, and without hesitation, the bear dived inside. Before Julian could tell what was happening, he felt an immense weight on top of him, pushing him down. The claws from the bear tore into his chest, and he gasped. Then it thrust its face forwards and clamped its jaws around Julian's neck. The attack was rapid, powerful, and relentless. With no light to see what was going on, Julian grappled in the darkness. His cries were silenced by the river and by the crushing of the bear's jaws, suffocating him and making it impossible for him to cry out. Then the bear tugged, forcefully pulling Julian from his tent. He kicked with his legs, trying to get away from the animal. He punched and tried to grab the bear, pulling at it, trying to find a weak spot, but nothing he did deterred the bear. Although he tried to fight back, the bear had taken him completely by surprise, and he hadn't been able to defend himself. He had been in a deep sleep when he was pounced on, and with a bite force of around 1,000 PSI, he struggled to release the bear's grip around his neck. The bear held onto Julian and dragged him away from his tent. The weight of Julian's body flattened the surrounding vegetation, leaving a trail of evidence. Blood poured from his neck as the bear's teeth severed blood vessels. He was losing blood fast and fading rapidly. With his adventure partner none the wiser and no one there to help him, he was at the mercy of the grizzly. But there isn't much one can do when a bear is in predatory mode. Most experts advise fighting back if the bear is intent on eating you, although it will likely stop at nothing. With male grizzly bears weighing in excess of 300 kilograms, 660 pounds, they are incredibly strong and powerful. A single swipe with their paw is enough to break a man's neck. The bear pulled Julian into the tree line, and moments later, Julian took his final breaths. He had lost too much blood. The injuries he sustained during the attack were unsurvivable, and he now lay motionless in the dark. The next morning, when dawn appeared on the horizon, Camille awoke from her slumber. She unzipped her tent and looked out through the flimsy canvas door. There, she saw the state of Julian's tent. It had been completely destroyed and now lay in a flattened and torn mess on the ground. Camille leapt up and jumped outside. She immediately began calling out for Julian. Her heart was in her mouth. She knew something terrible had happened to him and searched high and low for him. She could see the pools of blood around his tent. She followed the blood trail before spotting some other travelers. She ran over to them, distressed and begging for help. They had an emergency locating beacon and immediately activated it. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police received the distress beacon alert at 7.45 on the morning of August 15th. The signal was coming from 50 kilometers south of Tulita. The area was only accessible by sea and by air. The police and experts from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources flew into the area by helicopter. A search was immediately launched. There was clear evidence at the campsite of a bear attack, and now there was very little hope of finding Julian alive. Poor weather conditions hampered the search, and it wasn't until the following day that Julian's body was discovered. Camille and the group of other travelers she had made contact with for help were airlifted out of the area, physically unharmed. 
Members of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources located two bears in the area, a brown bear and a black bear. They shot both of them, and they were taken off to the labs for necropsies. Details from the findings have not been released, but it has been accepted that it was a grizzly bear that had attacked Julian. It was an incredibly tragic incident, made all the more tragic due to its rarity. Megan Wolberg from Environment and Natural Resources said that human bear encounters in the Northwest Territories are not uncommon, but fatalities are rare. There are estimated to be around 4,000 to 5,000 grizzlies in the Northwest Territories and a similar number of black bears. There had been three fatal attacks in the region since 2001. Two of those were by black bears and one from a grizzly. Unfortunately, on August 6, 2017, Julian Gauthier was added to those statistics of the latest bear attack victim to meet their terrifying final affliction. Michio Hoshino was born in 1952 in Ichikawa, Japan. As a teenager, he developed a passion and enthusiasm for wildlife photography. He was particularly eager to spend time in Alaska, having bought a photography book in which the village of Shishmaref was photographed. At the age of 19, he wrote to the village's mayor and received a reply six months later inviting him to visit. From that moment on, his career as a nature photographer was set, and he became one of the most accomplished photographers of his era, often being likened to the world-famous Ansel Adams. But tragically, his love for wildlife photography and the career path his skill and flair had paved for him led to a fearsome encounter that shook his family, friends, and colleagues. As a boy, Michio loved exploring the wilds of Japan. He was an adventurous individual who was captivated by the natural world around him, but also an avid reader of a range of different book genres. His love for storytelling and, ultimately, writing was a big part of his career as a wildlife photographer. At the age of 16, he traveled solo across North America. He visited all the big cities and the wonders of the likes of the Grand Canyon. When he returned to Japan, he attended Kiyo University, graduating in 1976 with a major in economics. It was during his time there that he came across the grainy photo of Shishmaref, that sparked his interest in Alaska. He wanted to know how the tiny community survived in such a bleak and inhospitable environment. He had so many questions, which is why he penned a letter and simply addressed it to Mayor Shishmaref, Alaska. During one of his university summers, he spent three months in the Eskimo village, living with a family and getting stuck into their way of life there. He returned to the state to study wildlife biology at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. He had secured some work experience with a professional photographer and put his own photography skills to the test. He would venture off to the remote Alaskan wilderness in pursuit of the perfect shots. He documented his ventures in numerous essays. He had a unique ability to bring his storytelling to life and through it and his photos. He brought the natural world of Alaska to people in all corners of the planet. His work soon earned him prestigious awards, and it was showcased all over the world. But his final photo, or at least what was believed to be his final photo, became one of his most famous yet. It was August 1996, and Michio had been assigned to work on the filming of a documentary about brown bears. He left his wife, Naoko, and his son, Shoma, in Alaska and set off for Russia. At that time, he and Naoko had been married for three years. The destination for Michio and the television production crew was Kuroskoya Lake, situated on the Kamchatka Peninsula, situated in the Russian Far East. The lake is a crater lake formed from the explosion or collapse of a volcano. It is surrounded by bush and trees mostly alder, pine, and stone birch. Back in 1996, the lake, which is a nature reserve, was thought to have the highest population of brown bears in Kamchatka and possibly even Russia. This was precisely why Michio and his team were headed there. They were guaranteed exceptional viewing of bear activity. The documentary they planned on filming 
was for a Japanese television station. The team's field guide, Igor Ravenko, who was a local expert, took the team to a known bear haunt. Rumor has it the guide knew of a bear that was unafraid of humans. It continued to fish in the crystal clear waters as people approached it. This was a photographer's dream. The team were able to capture unique and up-close footage of the animal as it continued to behave in its natural way, just feet from the cameras. But two days later, Igor, the guide, spotted some disturbing signs around their camp. Bear scat and markings were visible in and around it. When the team had been out in the wilderness, the bear had investigated their campsite. A chill ran down Igor's spine. Were they now the hunted? On August 8th, the production team had stopped work for the day and settled down in their cabin for the night. The cabin was full, and Michio opted to sleep outside in the tent. Igor advised him against it, knowing that the bear had already ventured into their camp and was unafraid of humans. But Michio insisted on staying in his tent. Not only did he prefer being closer to the great outdoors and having his own space, but he couldn't stand the sound of other people snoring. Being under canvas just yards from the cabin was a much better option for him and would ensure he'd get a decent night's sleep, or so he thought. The day had been long, and Michio quickly nodded off to sleep, warm in his sleeping bag, listening to the sounds of nature. But in the darkness outside, something stirred. It was a large grizzly bear that was prowling the surrounding woodland. It sniffed the air, the scent of the production team carried on the wind. It walked nearer, coming in for a closer look. Michio continued to sleep, unaware that his dreams were about to come crashing to an end. At 4 a.m., just before the milky haze of the dawn light, the bear sniffed outside Michio's tent. It snorted, and the vegetation under its heavy paws rustled the other side of the canvas. Its long snout was inches from Michio's face. He suddenly woke. The rustles, the deep-throated growling, and the loud sniffs had risen him from his slumber and had alerted him to the danger outside. He held his breath, listening and waiting. His mind was racing, and his heart began thundering in his chest. There was no way of alerting the others inside the cabin. All Michio could do was stay still and silent, hoping that the bear would lose interest and walk away. But the bear had other ideas. It had smelt something inside the tent, Michio himself. Suddenly, it slashed through the canvas with its front paws. There was nothing to protect Michio from the beast. It was in predatory mode, intent on securing its prey rapidly. Michio cried out in alarm and kicked at the face of the bear as it lunged through the canvas. His screams were heard by his colleagues in the cabin. Their guide, Igor, heard the commotion unfolding outside. It was 4 a.m. He opened the cabin door to see the back end of an enormous grizzly sticking out of Michio's tent. The bear was mauling the photographer, and Igor shouted, Tent! Bear! Tent! Everyone leapt out of their beds and ran outside. Michio was putting up a fight, but the bear bit down on him repeatedly, tearing flesh and biting into bone. He was powerless in the mighty beast's jaws. It shook its head from side to side, and Michio was thrown around like a rag doll. His colleagues were just 10 meters away. The tent had collapsed under the bear's weight, and underneath the canvas, Michio was grappling with the grizzly. Immediately, Igor grabbed a metal bucket and a spade. He ran towards the dilapidated tent and the ensuing attack, hitting the two items together. They crashed and banged in the night, the metal on metal ringing in their ears, but by the illumination of their flashlights, the bear didn't even flinch. Instead, it tugged and pulled at Michio, dragging him from his sleeping bag and into the dark, cold night. The others shouted at the animal, but it was in vain. It dragged Michio into the woodland and out of sight. His cries died down, and his friends knew that he had likely succumbed to his injuries, but in the darkness, they couldn't see anything. They had to wait until first light before they could track him down. They found his body in the woodland. It was a devastating finding and traumatic for those involved. The attack had happened so quickly and was thought to have been an exceedingly rare predatory attack. The noise from those who witnessed the attack and tried to intervene 
didn't deter the bear as it normally would. As news spread about the terrible incident, a photograph emerged on the internet and went viral. It was a disturbing image, and the caption claimed that it was the last photo Michio had taken on his camera. In the photo, an aggressive grizzly bear peers in through the open door of a tent. It's a terrifying image, showing the bear's long canines and dominant stance, apparently seconds before it launched its attack on Michio. But it is, in fact, a fake. The lighting on the animal is different from that on the tent. Outside is broad daylight when the attack occurred at around 4 a.m. Although Russia's north does experience daylight nights, in August, on the Kamchatka Peninsula, sunrise is between 5.30 and 6.30 in the morning. It was found that it was a Photoshop photograph which was entered into a competition called Worth 1000 Photoshop. It was entered under the category entitled Hoax Last Photo Taken Before Death. Those who knew Michio only had the nicest things to say about him. He was an incredibly humble and modest man. When meeting somebody new for the first time, he would ask them about their story and listen intently rather than talking about himself. In 1992, he founded the Aurora Club, which gives youths in Japan the chance to experience Alaska. His hope was that it would enrich their lives just as it had for him. Now, three decades later, the club is still running, and Michio continues to inspire the younger generation, as his photos and written works are still used throughout Japan today, such as in school textbooks. Michio was missed by so many that, 12 years after Michio's death, his life was commemorated at Halibut Point State Recreation Area, just north of Sitka. Woodcarver Tommy Joseph carved a totem pole out of a red cedar tree. Depicted in it was Michio at the bottom, holding his beloved camera, and above him were the animals he loved to photograph. A fitting tribute to an inspiring man who left this planet too soon after meeting his terrifying final affliction.